Belgium, please. Thank you. Sorry, Reg, I didn't mean to make you jump. I need everybody to be quiet so you can hear what I'm saying. Yep. Okay. Now, uh, I've got a little preamble here, which I'm roughly going to follow. If you need to go to the toilet, go now. Yeah, please do not interrupt this. The reason we say that is, this is a first for us in NA. We're creating history because we have done several of these already, these interviews, okay, because these are mainly for archiving, these. And so far we've only got Dudley's one, which is because Dudley is with us anymore. So we normally do this behind closed doors and it's private. The only reason we're doing this today with you monkeys in the room is to be quite <laughs> simply this, that the convention committee were kind enough to give us space and then somebody went and put it on the programme. So we were meant to have that door locked. So what we would like you guys to do is to... So I'm going to hand the meeting over to Vicky, who's going to lead the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Vicky Amanadix. Um, this is um, Vicky. People on Mickey, I'm an addict. I want you to know that I haven't, I don't know any of these questions. They, Vicky offered to tell me the questions in advance, but I thought it would be so much more fun <laughs> and spontaneous if I just didn't know. So, so I have no idea what this is going to be. I just one add thing I cleaned up on the 11th of June 1981. So you can do the maths. 41 years and 10 months, so, right. <coughs> Thank you, Mickey. Right, moving on from that, so we're going to go through this nicely. Please describe how you found out about NA and what the first meeting was that you attended. Okay, I was, uh, I, I was in a detox unit for alcoholics. There was no treatment for drug addicts then, or maybe there was, I don't know, but middle of June 1981, Dudley, who's one of the founder members, came to see me. Um, I'm kind of trying to make these stories because I think we all go well on stories and this is not about a yes or no answer, so, but I'll tell them quick. And Dudley came to see me, I remember, 41 years ago, I remember, I was sitting in the coffee lounge and this guy comes in with the, with the uh, ugliest man I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> You know, it looked like cross between a cabbage patch doll and a beaten up chipmunk. And, and he came with this um, American guy who looked like a rock star with really long hair, beautiful man, you know. And he um, started talking about NA. Never heard of NA. Never heard about fellowships. You, you know, um, I can make a joke about fellowships, but we don't have time for that. But um, didn't know about fellowships. And I wasn't really interested in fellowships. By the time he left me, I was an NA member. Because he had such love in his eyes and such self-acceptance and exactly what we talk about, attraction, not promotion, and such humility that by the time he left, I was an NA member. Um, the first NA meeting I ever went to was when I started on Sunday day. I got out, the week I got out of treatment, I started a meeting. Um, Sunday night, Western Supermare. First NA meeting I ever went to. How old were you at that time? Oh, 25. How did it feel to be a newcomer? And please describe any of your early memorable experiences. Look, uh, the, th the thing is, I, when I got into the fellowship, I'd already accepted it was done. That I'd finished using drugs. I'd already accepted, I'd already reached my bottom. I didn't have any more using to do. So... For me, there was no struggle <coughs> in being a newcomer. The struggle was living without drugs with all the feelings and experiences and confusion that was going on. And the fact that when you're new and you're like a lightly boiled egg, just held together by a skin all runny inside, you know, anything could, could, can, throw you, can throw me off target. So I was very happy to be new. I recognised that I was at the beginning of a very exciting thing because the fellowship was tiny. There was three people in front of me, right? And one of those was a nutter. Um, 
it turned out to be great. And, and so, and so, yeah, yeah. And so, I, I was excited. I was excited, and I was excited to go to NA because I hated AA. <laughs> It's the truth. My sponsor, I was given a sponsor, he phoned me up after my first meeting, he said to me, did you go to the meeting? I said, yeah. He said, did you enjoy it? I said, no. He said, why, were you there? <laughs> that was, anyway, that's that, uh, yeah. Thank you. What are you, talking about sponsors, what are your memories of sponsorship when you first came into NA? Um, and also, what was the first suggestion you followed for your sponsor that you found helpful? I, I was, I had an, I had a sponsor that was two years in AA. Um, NA in London, I, I was living in Western and there was one meeting in London and though everyone used to come up for the Sunday night meeting, drive all the way up to Western, and when I went back to London I also drove all the way up to Western, six hour round trip just to go to a meeting, you know, go to any lengths then. Um, I was sponsored by by a couple of three AA guys before I took the third step and decided to put my faith in one fellowship. And and the, the I didn't really I'm not really someone you can give advice to. So so sponsors used to say to me things like, go to meetings and share and that's what I heard and I was okay with that. Brilliant. I've had some dodgy sponsors, let me tell you. <laughs> I had a sponsor who used to have me on my knees. He had his hands in his pockets. But, yeah, he never hurt me, but... <laughs> yeah, hey. Well, I was just going to ask... I was 25. How's your experience of sponsorship changed over, changed over your recovery journey? Yeah, of course, of course. Of course, of course. To me, uh, uh, sponsorship today is very, very different to sponsorship. Sponsorship then was very directive, like you do what you were told. Basically, more or less, you do what you were told. Uh, sponsorship now is a relationship between two pupils. One with more experience than the other, but not necessarily. My sponsor today has been clean 25 years less than me. A fantastic relationship. I don't need to go anywhere else. That's not what it's about. So, from being a directive, which is what sponsors used to be, to being more like inclusive and sharing, which is what it is today, is, is you know, one is how it's changed. And um, have you ever relapsed? No. <laughs> when you came into NA initially... Not yet. <laughs> when you came into NA initially, how many groups, meetings were available? There was one meeting, Thursday night Millman Street. And how many people on average were going there? Three. They're all dead now. Is that your home group then? It was my home group after a few months when I went back to London. Yeah. So how important, looking at the whole journey of recovery, how important is the atmosphere of recovery in a meeting to you? So, when I was in this place, it was led by a psychiatrist called Jim Ditzler, who's probably dead now. He was in his 50s then and that was 40 years ago. So, and I, I used to ask him questions and he never used to answer them because he was a psychiatrist. So he just like, yeah, cool. right, so I'm supposed to learn myself. But I asked him once, what made people relapse? Because I was always scared that I'd definitely use again. Always, always. I was absolutely sure I was gonna use again. The fact that I didn't is like, you know. And I, used to, and I once asked him what made people use again? And he thought about it and he said to me, negative thinking. So that answers the question? That answers the question, yeah. absolutely. What's your experience of service in the fellowship being like over the years? It's what makes me belong. <coughs> it's what makes me belong. Service has been... Well, look, you, you, you know what? I mean, basically, my, my thing about service is that this is my fellowship. And you are my people. Mm. And this is where I belong. So I serve the community. And if I can't be the boss of a man, if I can't be the boss, I'll sweep the floor. Doesn't matter. Yeah. Service is like, I've always been involved in service from, you know, within six weeks clean to right up to day, there's never ever been a time that I wasn't doing something. And when I finish what I'm doing, I'll just move on and do something else. Thanks. We're going to have a 30 second pause. What is your experience 
that's a big question, of working the steps, and how has this process changed your life? Oh, that's a, that's a really easy question to answer. Because the steps, are, the steps are, I mean, the thing is, my understanding today is the steps are tools, so I'm free to use them or not. If I, if I don't want to use them, I have grief. Sometimes I need grief before I use them. But the steps are tools, and they're tools to use in order to help me function out there or deal with whatever problems are making me <coughs> suicidal or depressed or whatever. And what was the question? What's my understanding? <laughs> the question is, what's your experience of working with steps, and how has this process changed? So you know what? I'll, I'll give you a great example. I'll give you a great example. That when I joined... Uh, when I joined the program, it was the steps were explained to me and I didn't understand because, because the steps are not an academic exercise, they're experience. Everything's experiential, nothing's academic. So although people said to me step three means let go, um, hand up, you know. I was sponsored by a guy called Belfast Archie in AA when I was three years clean. He was absolutely brilliant and he's, he's dead now and he sponsored a lot of young NA guys. Right. We didn't have a choice. We had to go there. There was only a few meetings of anyway. And, and one day he turned around to me and he said to me, Mickey, I want you to make a decision. Because I was doing service in both fellowships. Mm -hmm. He said to me, I want you to make a decision. I was 28 years old. I want you to make a decision. Just pick a fellowship and go with it. Mm -hmm. It's a really amazing thing he did for me. So I did. 30 years later, I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing the third step again and I do the third step and I leave it and I'm walking and I suddenly realize the first time I took the third step was when I made the decision to choose one program and one fellowship I'm not saying above another that's my path that's the one I chose right so if you said to me now what does the third step mean to you you know a few years ago I might have said let go or hand over now I say it means take the risk so, every step uh, has different meanings and, and over the years changes in my understanding of them and what I need to do. I'll tell you what I do, what I work the most these days, amazing, is six and seven. Amazing. So this time round has been the hardest for me of working the steps, because I'm doing them again now. I'm on step nine, I'm doing it again now, and, and I've got... And I've got an, an awful lot from them. I've learned new tools. Every time I go around them, I get new tools. And now I realise if, if I've got shit going on, generally, if I work step six and I work step seven, that gets rid of the shit, eventually. <coughs> My ability to understand and deal with what's going on. The thing is, I mean, you know, life on life's terms, life's not easy for all of us all the time. You know, it's quite difficult some of the time. So, it's a general answer, I think. Yeah. yeah. Can you describe... Hello, man. <laughs> <laughs> Can you describe your experience of working with traditions? How has your application of these influenced your life both in and out of the fellowship? <laughs> okay, a funny thing, tradition, so... You know, you're in a committee meeting and someone throws a tradition up, right? And then there's an argument. <coughs> All the traditions have to be understood with common sense. Common sense, right? And the traditions always, the answer to all the traditions is God expressing himself in our group conscience. So I always think I'm right. <laughs> right? So, I mean, that's a very, very simple answer to quite a profound question because the traditions are like um, behavioral. It's a behavioral program. If I, if I wanted to try and describe it, whereas the steps are sort of experiential and the traditions are sort of behavioural, sort of that guides me in my behaviour, in, not only in service, but in the real world too. And the thing about tradition one, where it says um, our common welfare, look, I'm going to roll it straight out, like I know what I'm talking about, our common welfare should come first, personal recovery depends on NAUNT, there's, uh, there's chapters on that, but basically, to me, it means this, if I want a clean world, I'll stop complaining about everyone else who drops it and stop dropping it myself. Right? That's what the first tradition means. You know, I put the best I can into a name. <coughs> stop worrying about people who don't do the same. <laughs> of course, that's not true. <laughs> I do worry all the time about people who don't do the same, but 
that's that's if I want to work the tradition properly and all the traditions properly, then that's the place I have to come from, right? I have to be understanding that a group conscience is probably more correct than my conscience. It, it, that's always been the case, and and understanding traditions can only be explained with common sense, common sense, you know, and a group conscience. Thank you. Yeah. Did you know that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> um, what is your experience of prayer and meditation? How has this changed over the years? Um, I'll, tell you how I med I'll tell you what I do today. First, okay, when I first got clean, I'd go to church. I'm, I'm Jewish, by the way, and I'm traditional. I, I, I keep the Sabbath as much as possible, and, I, and some of the higher days are important to me, and, I've, uh, and I follow them. However, that's the culture of, that I was born into. It's not my my spiritual life is guided and in, in these rooms with you people, you guys. And, and when I first got clean, I used to go to church and I used to pray, oh, God, help me, say, I can't stand, why doesn't she fancy me? And all this kind of stuff, and, you know, and because I was so sure I was going to use, I'd do anything they said, you know, on your knees, on your knees. <laughs> Over the years, I've come to learn, if, 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 I, if I go to the meet, a meeting and I listen for the message, I'll hear it. The, the problem is very often I'll go to meetings and I'll, and I'll be too self-obsessed or I won't go in with a, there'll be a message for me in the meeting. If I shut up and listen, I'll hear the message. And in that way, um, I'll get the answer. I'm not someone who can meditate very well. And even today, I, I've got the um, spiritual principles on my phone. Uh, from um, You can all get them on you. They're amazing. The new spiritual principles book. So... It's much longer to read than, than, the, than the just for today. <laughs> and so in the morning I get up before everyone, I feed the dogs, I sit at the kitchen table, open the phone, and I read the first paragraph and skip to the last one. <laughs> That's what I do. I know, I, know, I know a lot of people actually meditate, but I have a lot of trouble sitting on my ass still. You know, a lot of trouble with that. So, so I'm God conscious, you know. I hear the message, but I'm not very good at sitting still. But I'll also, I'm comfortable with it. And I know that I'll hear the message. I know, I know that to get around some of the shit, and it's quite, it's quite difficult being me, even though I try not to take myself too seriously. Like just like everyone here's experiences, is difficult being you. That I'm, that I'm conscious. That I need to hear the message, and if I hear the message, I get what I need. And in that way, I meditate. I don't have a problem with God. It's just a springboard for having faith. Without faith, you've got nothing. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any? I mean, you have mentioned some, but are there any significant members who are no longer around who played an important part in your recovery? Would you like to acknowledge these people? No. Oh God, there are hundreds. Hundreds. Do you know? Well, you know, I'll get on with it. I'll get on with almost everyone, apart from the H and I people. <laughs> yeah, apart from the H and I people, uh, I've got. I need to do some work on that. Um, I get on with most people, and I like most people. Um, so the people that were there before me and with me, my friends in the beginning, you know, I have fond memories of them. I was, I was. Uh, I was one of the guys that carried Dudley's coffin. I'm tremendously proud that, 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 that I was important enough that they chose me to do that. I remember his, his daughter, Dudley, said to me, uh, I want you to speak at my funeral. And I said, OK. And then, and then I said to his daughter, why does he want me to speak at his funeral? There are so many people much more articulate than me. You know, he was in the acting world. He had people genuinely, hilariously funny. And, and she said, because he loved you loves you. So there's people that touch me, you know. But I'll tell you something, so last summer I was walking on a beach. <coughs> this is true. I was in Spain on holiday, I was walking on a beach, and a member of the fellowship who's been cleaning, I don't know, five or six years, phoned me up. He says to me, 
I just listened to one of your tapes on the on, on online, and it made me cry, man. I just wanted to thank you, and I thought, oh my god, imagine that. That's like amazing. I listen to my tapes. I don't think they're that good. Um, <laughs> I've listened to one of them. Um, so all the time, there's people that touch me. You can't single them out. I mean, obviously, the people in my peers at the beginning, Pandora, Pandora, the first female recovering person that came in with me, very ill now, still alive. I'm still in touch with her. Some of the with Mary, you know, who's dead. One or two others who died using, using Rosie, went back to prostitution, died. Really upset about that, even though it's like 40 years ago. <coughs> Still upset about that. So lots of people touch me all the time, but even today, right, I can be touched by people. So it's like an, it's an ongoing thing, isn't it? It's an ongoing thing. It's not just like, oh, I wish it was like it used to be. <laughs> it's not like that. I get, yeah, everyone's in, every, yeah, lots and lots of people important. No, no, I didn't mean you. <laughs> no, it was all there, not me. I've got self important. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Yeah. What would you say to your former self if you walked into a meeting today and met you as you were then? <laughs> 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 I mean, I guess everyone answers that as keep coming back. That's what they answer. It's an NA thing. It's a fellowship thing. No, I'd, I'd say you're, you're on a good path, mate. You know, just enjoy the journey. It's not always easy. But it's always okay. Thank you. What okay. number are we on? We're on. We're, we're done with 21. Oh, well. Doing, we're, doing, we're doing well. Yeah. You're doing well, sorry. <laughs> Can you describe in your experience changes you have seen in meetings over the years? Yeah. One of my personal bugbears is the pot. I have a real problem with, with large swathes of people not putting money in the pot. Right? Do you know what I'm saying? Look, it's okay, you know, it's not for me to judge who can afford what. And, and I get like, you know, crazy about stuff, and then I suddenly realise, don't be an arsehole, you, right? But it used to be, there was never a problem paying rent. Mm -hmm. Never a problem. My home group now is a problem paying the rent. Mm -hmm. Large swathes of people, five or six at a time, they look in the pot. I don't know if you saw um, <coughs> that movie, Beetlejuice where the hand comes out of the prawn cocktail and grabs him in the face and goes like that. People look in the pot and I think, what do you think? Is the hand going to come out and grab your face? You know, and they change in a way that when there's a service position, it's very hard sometimes to fill it. It seems to me that I'm sure people are committed. I'm sure they are. I'm sure I just misunderstand it and times have changed. But in the early days, you couldn't get a service commitment unless you were friendly with everyone. Because everyone would go for it. Everyone. Everyone. And there was just like 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 of us or 60 of us. <coughs> now there's thousands. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of us. And if you have a service commitment, it's like, it doesn't get filled. So, if I try and take a view of not being judgmental, it's like, I guess the fellowship's big now. And there's always someone that will cover it. And it's easier now to... I, th I think that there was just a feeling then like we were part of something. Part of something really special. And I don't know if that's true now. But the thing is, people are still getting better, so I must be wrong. But I'll tell you what I do find. that I went down to Preston. I go down to Preston quite a lot. The office is there, but also there's people I love down there. And when you go there, it's like the fellowship was when it started here. All service commitments get filled and everyone puts what they can afford in the pot. So it's a different kind of mindset, you know, but... I mean, that sounds quite critical, doesn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, the fact is, this is still my, my place where I belong. I mean, the fellowship's changed for, for, in, in good ways as well. I mean, we, we have, we have, we have, we have uh, the structure now to serve the whole fellowship. Um, we have uh, an office, 
and we have committee meetings and everyone does really good work to grow the fellowship. And in fact, one of the things is that when, when uh, I became chair of UKSO, um, and it would have been eight years ago, eight years ago, um, we, we, we discovered, the committee discovered that actually we needed a bigger office to serve a massively growing, expanding fellowship. And uh, in that service commitment, you kind of learn about what the fellowship does in the country rather than sitting in meetings. And, and the fellowship's growing and growing and growing and growing, even though there's a lot of stuff online now because of the pandemic. You know, it's still growing and growing and growing and growing. And, and so, and so that, and that's a sign that it's still, despite my finding fault with certain things, it's still, you know, I don't really know what I'm talking about because it's still growing and growing and growing and growing. So, so, so there's lots of, you know, ways the fellowship's slightly different, but there's lots of ways the fellowship's slightly sort of more able to carry the message and support newcomer and stuff like that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, right, how do you see the future direction of the fellowship of LA and what are your hopes and wishes for its development? Uh, do you know something? When I was when I was a director, I wanted to do a Brexit. I'm sorry to tell you, and the others the others said that no, fuck off. Don't be ridiculous. Right, we're part of a wider community. I go all right. It was just an idea. <laughs> but uh, I see the fellowship. Uh, so you know what we um. This is quite a story that that um, when we were talking about moving the office. Uh, so I. I because because I have service experience, I, I can talk about this. I, so when we talk about moving the office, you went down to AA in Yorkshire to talk to them about how they did it. Because they used to be in Old Court. When I cleaned up, I lived opposite their office in Old Court, and uh, they moved to Yorkshire and they got this great building with a stainless steel lift, right? And um, and um, a load of us went down there uh, from UKSO, five or six or seven of us, and and we we went down there to. So to find out what happened when they moved, what happened with the fellowship. And the head honcho of, um, of AA, whose name I've forgotten, he, he took us to one side. He sat us in the boardroom and he said, you should be doing this now. You should be moving now. You should be getting a bigger office to serve a bigger fellowship. It's exactly what happened to us. It's not 100% true because they print their own literature and we don't, but... Uh, and they invest in property and we don't. <laughs> but um, they're a little bit bigger organisation, but... But, what was the question? <laughs> How do you see the direction of the Right, so, we, we have the infrastructure now for the first ship to grow and grow and grow and grow and us supporting that furniture with, with literature, which is basically the function of the office, to provide literature uh, 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 to meetings and areas so that they can, you know, get more meetings and, you know, carry the message. You, you know, the thing is, so I see things carrying on. I mean, the things that my, my point of reference for the first meeting, where I walked into my first meeting, is 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 the fellowship has just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's plenty of people 30 years clean I've never met before. So I'm used to sort of like like I know everyone, but I don't. There's plenty of people with decades doing great service in NA, never even met them before. So NA is just growing and growing and growing. So I. I think that that will carry on. Having been involved in the office, I see that there's evidence for that. What I hope would happen is the same. The thing about the thing about the fellowship is, we're all here in different places in our lives, different problems. Some of us are really upset, depressed. Some of us are really happy, ecstatic. We're all different clean times, and we're all different, and yet we're all here together. And that's the same as every meeting. So why would it not grow the same? Why would that not continue? So that's what I see and that's what I would hope. Because in the end, it's down to the individual getting clean as to whether the fellowship grows or not. If people aren't getting clean, the fellowship's not going to grow. I can't see that it'd be any other way. Yeah. I don't want to do a Brexit anymore. <coughs> <laughs> Just an idea. Do you have a message for newcomers? Good health is contagious. Bad health, much more contagious. <laughs> you know what? Um, I got clean on the backs of my friends. 
I got clean on friendships. Okay, that's the absolute truth. I didn't get clean on my understanding or desire to work the program. That came in time. I got clean on the backs of friendships and in that I was working a very good program. It's really important to have faith. It's really important to have faith and it's really important to look around and see other people doing it. You know, yeah. Get a sponsor who doesn't put his hands in his pockets when he's talking to you. <laughs> what are your feelings? This is a penultimate question. What are your feelings, experience of online meetings? That is both recovery and committee meetings. Yeah, great. You know, if you like them, truck on. As soon as we came, you know. The, the, I was in Spain in February 2020. I was in Spain for a weekend. I came back with COVID. It was before the pandemic had hit. It hit Spain. People were dying. And I came back and I was sick. I was really sick for five weeks. And when I got well, I was on my back. And when I got well, there were no meetings anymore. And this was like, not only did I learn a lot from it, which is another story, it shocked me to my core. I didn't have any anymore. And I didn't, I never ever got, I know lots of people got online really quick, a lot of people got clean online, really love online meetings. Never happened for me. I found one meeting I went to once a week that survived for me. The rest, I always found them quite difficult. Didn't have the same energy and the same feeling as a live meeting, the same exposure. I don't know, I don't know. I'll tell you a funny story, oh my God. I was at NA Region. Before the pandemic, Lisa knows. <laughs> and there was this guy that was running online meetings, right? And he wanted a space in, re in the UK region for his online meetings. And he didn't get it because his online meetings were made up of people all over the world. So they didn't have an area. So it was really difficult. This is in the beginning. It might be they're making space now, right? It's all changed now. But, and I said to him, I thought, <laughs> and I said across the table in front of everyone in the room, I said, I thought, if he thought that was going to take off, he had mental illness. <laughs> That's what I said to him, across the room, in front of 30 people, in a committee meeting. And then I, and then I suddenly felt bad about it, and I, I bought him some flowers in the afternoon. And me and him are good, me and him are good mates now, and we did, in fact, we did a chair together at the last convention. In fact, we did something, we did something in, in Swansea three weeks ago or four weeks ago together, and a talk the nature of my talk. Um, so, so obviously you all know now that because of the, the online meetings really took off and <coughs> RH and I, UK H and I committee meetings which I had just stood down as chair of um, are online. But So I accept it but I actually, the truth is for me personally, I wouldn't go to an online meeting unless I didn't, unless I had to. There's you know, live meetings have opened up again. but. I think, of course, they. So now they're part of our fellowship, right? So that's great. But me personally, I don't. I don't need to go. So I won't stay in London. I mean, stay in. Yeah, I live here, so there's lots and lots and lots and lots of meetings. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Finally, I think I've said so much. I think. I think I'd like to say that being clean a long time brings its own problems. And really, what I want to do, so I had some issues around, because I did a history of NHA at the last convention, and then I did one in Western convention, and then, <laughs> and then I did one, another one, and then last time I did one at uh, Speaker Jam, and, and now I'm doing this, and I'm doing one in Hull. And I, I was saying to my sponsor, you know what? I sound like a circuit speaker. I don't want to be a circuit speaker. But I'm get asked to speak about so I like, like I have more information than I'm supposed to know anything. But I actually don't know anything. And that's how I want to be. I just want to be an NA member. And I appreciate that when I cleaned up, people who had two years clean were like, no, never, impossible, two years clean. And I, and I, I know that people are a long time clean. It has that effect, but you know what? 
you put your head down one day at a time. Before you know it, you're an old guy and you're clean four years. And you think, fuck, how did that happen? <coughs> Certainly, I'm not sure I had a lot, lot to do with it. Right, I just turned up. So that's my message. Just turn up. Yeah, that's it. I'm done, yeah. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Vicky.